Hello, and welcome to PCHF's Awareness and Advocacy webinar series. My name is Dr. Sama Akhtar, and I will be moderating this webinar uh, titled An Anecdotal Review of Congenital Heart Disease Advocacy, Global Arch, and Addressing Lifelong Outcomes. Today, PCHF is honored and thrilled to welcome Ms. Amy Verstappen. Ms. Verstappen is the president and chair of the Global Alliance for Rheumatic and Congenital Hearts, and of course, a good friend of PCHF's. Global Arch is a nonprofit organization that was initiated in 2018. Its premise is the alliance of organizations that help rheumatic and congenital heart disease patients and families and organizations. The collective vision is to empower patients and families to improve and prolong the life of every um, uh, child and adult uh, with congenital or rheumatic heart disease, regardless of where they were born. Ms. Verstappen herself has been a patient advocate and health educator since 1996. While dealing with her own challenges, living with a complex heart defect, she served as president of the Adult Congenital Heart Association from 2001 to 2013. She has also served as an advisor to the CDC, the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, and the International Society for Adult Congenital CHDs, and has also worked with CHD patients and professional groups throughout the USA and the world. Ms. Verstappen has also co opted authored 15 papers, which have been published in world-renowned peer-reviewed journals. With a warm welcome, I would now like to hand things over to Amy Verstappen. Welcome. Thank you so much. That was quite an introduction. I really appreciate it. I am deeply honored to be here and humbled by the work that you at PCHF do. So what I was invited to talk about today is three... Hmm. Um, just checking my slides, which are not going now. So let's see, my apologies. Oh, there we go. Three separate topics. First of all, talk about why the need for global CHD advocacy and what we're talking about when we talk about that. Talk specifically about the role of patient family groups and of Global Arch and address the issue of lifelong outcomes. So when we look at the world, the need for congenital heart disease advocacy becomes extremely apparent. In high-income countries, there is universal access to prompt diagnosis and needed surgery, which means that by 30 years ago, by 1990, a person born even with the most complex congenital heart disease was expected to live to age 18. Meanwhile, in low and middle income countries, which is where 90% of the world's children live, this picture is very different. There is typically delayed or no diagnosis and very few children, less than 10%, have access to any kind of pediatric cardiac surgery if they needed to survive. We know that there are many, many uh, nonprofit organizations, charitable groups around the world that are working to help with this, that many groups that do surgical missions, that fly children in, that fly um, children out, that do training. But when you look at a global level, at a large scale impact in terms of the population, the percent of children in any given country that has access to care, there's really been minimal large scale impact despite the fact that we've had successful treatment for these diseases for over 70 years. And a recent study that was published in 2020 about the burden of congenital heart disease found a surprising finding, which is they estimated the global prevalence of congenital heart disease to be much higher than we had previously thought. So traditionally we say congenital heart disease, which is by far the most common birth defect is present in about one in a hundred births. But this group um, estimated it to be present in 1.8% live births, so almost twice as high. And the reason for that is because they looked at data, not just from high income countries, but really looked at the data from poorer countries like Pakistan. And they speculated that the reason that the prevalence is higher 
is because of genetic and environmental factors that might be more um, present in poor countries that would raise your risk of any kind of birth defect, including congenital heart disease. Congenital heart disease is the number six cause of global infant mortality, and it's the number two cause in high income countries. And the percent of mortality caused by congenital heart disease is increasing. And it's not increasing because there's more congenital heart disease. We think it's about the same. And it's not increasing because congenital heart disease is getting more fatal. It's increasing for, in some ways, a good reason. So all around the world, um, countries are having increasing success at lower, lowering their infant mortality rate due to other causes. So you can see this very clearly when you look at Pakistan. So this is a chart looking at the childhood mortality, so children who die before age five, a list of the reasons, the causes of those deaths. So you can see that in 2000, congenital heart disease was number 14 on the list. So it was number 14 in reasons why children died under age five in Pakistan. Now, when we look at 2019, it's now the number nine cause of childhood mortality in Pakistan. It actually went up the most of any cause of childhood mortality in this data set. And that's because as Pakistan has increasing success in addressing things like diarrhea and meningitis and preterm birth, this group of patients will increasingly be left as the infants and children wants to continue to improve the health of their country. This population has to be dealt with. You, we can't continue to improve preventing, you know, preventing childhood death unless we keep children born with congenital heart disease alive. So how do we do that? It's very hard. And, and this is one challenge of heart disease and what makes it very different from all those other problems. This is a chart that was created by the Children's Heart Link, which is a nonprofit humanitarian organization in the US. And it just outlines all the different parts that have to be present at every level of the healthcare system in order to be able to successfully treat a child born with heart disease. So it doesn't start at the hospital, of course, it starts with diagnosis, the ability to diagnose, the ability to transfer, and then you get to the heart of it, which is the Pediatric Cardiac Surgical Center. And it has been argued that training people to do complex surgeries on a heart the size of a walnut is perhaps uniquely complex in medicine. So this is a huge endeavor. And I know that PCHF is doing an extraordinary job moving this forward, are building a center and have made huge progress, but it takes a long time. It's very different than vaccinating children for measles, for example. And it's been estimated that it takes about 10 years from the moment you decide you wanna do pediatric cardiac surgery to the point when you will have a full scale center takes about 10 years. It is a long time and it is resource intensive. So this is a daunting challenge. We know we have to do it. We know all of those children deserve it, but it also is very complicated and very resource intensive. And this is what brings us to advocacy because the only way this is done successfully in any country, if you look around the world, the only countries that have made success have government investment and buy-in. This is part of what the government supports and promotes. Um, that's true in the US. So the first generation of pediatric cardiologists in the US were trained through government grants and continues to be true. This can't be done unless you have engagement, not just by all the wonderful doctors and nurses and patients and families and charitable organizations, but you have to get government buy-in. You have to have it at the regional level, the national level, and also in the global health conversation um, when we talk about the World Health Organizations and groups like that. And we know that as of now, congenital heart disease isn't on the agenda. We've really been absent from this agenda. And this was a big 
part of why Global Arch was founded is thinking about how can we really empower more advocacy to make real sustainable change by working with governments. And the reason we focus on patient family organizations or one major reason is that this is what patient family organizations do. Not all of them, but it's one of the things that around the world and in all disease states, patient family and patient advocacy organizations do is they work directly with government. They are the ones that can go meet with their local health of officials, bring those voices there and negotiate and raise awareness. And in the HIV AIDS community, there's a huge um, history here. You, some of you may be familiar. If, if anybody ever doubts the power of patient family advocacy to transform a disease, I encourage you to look at the history of HIV AIDS, where in countries like South Africa, um, outcomes were completely transformed by patients themselves speaking up and asking for what they needed. These are pictures of five Global Arch member organizations meeting directly with their health officials in their country. We have the US, Lebanon, Bulgaria, Namibia, and then of course on the top right, uh, a PC. Now, there was a wonderful explanation given for Global Arch at the beginning. So I will just briefly say that as was mentioned, we were founded to be a common voice for the congenital rheumatic heart disease organizations um, to promote advocacy. Currently, we have 30 group members in 23 countries, and half of them are in low and middle income countries. And our, our, our alliance is free. Any organization can join, and you can join with no obligation. Essentially, the idea is we bring the groups together. They have opportunities to connect and take shared action. Our mission, as was noted, is to improve worldwide lifelong outcomes. And our focus, our mechanism is on the patient family organizations. So helping those groups work together, helping create new groups and um, helping support them in their work and creating, the, giving them tools to do their jobs better. One big initiative at Global Arch is based on the idea of congenital heart disease care as a human right. So when Global Arch was founded at our first meeting, we put together a very basic declaration of rights for congenital heart patients. The World Health Organization says that every person has the right to health, that health is a basic human right. And so what we are asserting is every person with childhood onset heart disease has that right. So the fact that I was born with congenital heart disease doesn't mean that I have any less right to health and any less right to live a long life than any other person. I mean, I get that right. It may, you know, but I, I somehow I, I don't deserve it less. And so we took our initial brief declaration statement and we expanded it into what is a policy document. It's about a page and a half long. It's not very long. You can read it at our website um, into a more formal rights declaration in the way health policy would word it that is at our website. And essentially what this declaration states is we have some specific rights to guarantee our right to health. We have the right to heart care that is affordable, accessible, safe, high quality, patient-centered, and lifelong. And we have a right to well-being that this is just as important, including protection from stigma, social inclusion, access to education and employment, medical privacy, and access to social benefits. And in addition to asserting these rights, the document then very specifically outlines the actions that governments must take to address these rights. So this begins with to fund detection, surgery, and long-term care, but it also includes collecting and reporting outcomes, not just in health, but in social well-being, to create and enforce quality standards, and to promote patient-centered care, which is, of course, at the center of quality care is patient-centered care. 
to include congenital heart disease and rheumatic heart disease in existing disability services and benefits. In many countries, such as the United States, there are lots of programs for people with diseases and disabilities, but congenital heart disease is just not included. Governments can help raise awareness and combat stigma. And we also encourage governments to promote and support congenital heart disease civic engagement. Those patient family organizations are an essential piece of what should be present in a healthy um, society. Now, this rights declaration is not a magic wand. It only will do what we use it for. And so what we are doing right now is we are soliciting endorsements. So we are getting major cardiac organizations and other organizations to endorse this and say, yes, we believe in these rights as well. We, Global Arch, are running awareness campaigns on social medias and in other venues. Um, we have a big one coming up for Congenital Heart Awareness Day. Here are some images from our previous campaigns. And we're using this document as a tool so for many people who don't typically think about government advocacy, it's hard to even know what it is that governments would or should do. And this document can help groups in local areas really think very concretely about what is it that we want them to do and how in our setting would we be able to ask them to do that. So what else do patient and family organizations do? Why else is it important to empower these groups? Well, a huge piece of this, and this is what every group does that I know of, whether or not they do advocacy or education or other things like that, is peer support. Peer support and education is really at the core of every initiative of patient family organizations. And I can't, overestimate how transformative these groups can be. For me, as a congenital heart survivor, when I first met people with my disease, it truly changed my life. Having the ability to talk to somebody else who knows what you're talking about is a lifeline, and it's like no other lifeline. And just that, I think, does a huge um, job of feeding the depression and anxiety and stigma that can come from managing uh, you know, life live, living chronic fatal disease for families and for patients. But the other role of patient family organizations is education. They can do huge efforts in promoting health literacy, helping parents understand things in the way they need to. And this is important everywhere, but what we are told is this is especially important in countries where the you know, there just aren't a lot of resources. If, if this is a pediatric cardiac center or care center where there aren't nurses to explain things, there's, you know, the doctors and medical staff are just much too busy taking care of medical needs. Um, this is where patient family organizations can really help with caring for patients and families and providing some of that education and social support to each other. This can take the burden off of the center, whether it's a rich or poor country, really. And here are some pictures of different efforts of our member groups. And I want to highlight the role of online communities in part because when we talk about patient family groups, what we find is in countries where there is a major stigma associated with having congenital heart disease or having a child with it, many, many, many families and patients will not go to an in-person group. They are much too worried about the stigma. They are too worried that people will know. And the online groups can be hugely important in these areas. They exist all over the world, but I wanna give a call out to Ms. Uh, Mukhtar, Mehwish Mukhtar, who is a new board member at Global Arch, but has also started a Facebook page specifically for Pakistan, which is on the top right, the Reason2 CHD family page. And this is a great new initiative for getting families and patients information opportunities to get um, educated without having to deal with shame and social stigma. And what else do we need to educate about? Well, as I said, congenital heart disease is a chronic disease. And we find globally that there is still a big problem globally, that there is still a widespread perception now 
that heart surgery can be curative, especially for people with simpler defects. Um, and so one of Global Arch's core missions is to work with all our groups to help as we educate, always have that message embedded that this is a lifelong condition. And here are some activities by our groups. I particularly like that finished picture. It's really a good news, bad news surgery. We really hoped in 1961 when I was born, there was great hope that this was curative, that you know, the children were blue, you'd fix the heart, they'd be pink and everything would be fine. But as you know, the bad news and the unexpected news is there is high morbidity and mortality in adults. Um, children tend to be really well. And as people age, after about 15 to 20 years out of surgery, the rates of complications go extremely high. Pregnancy is especially risky. Most women with congenital heart disease, over 90% can have a pregnancy safely, but it does have significant risks and everybody does need lifelong care. Um, and I wanna just talk a little about the simple defects because there is still, I think, a widespread misperception and you can actually see this in some of the existing care guidelines or underestimation of the risks of the simple defects. And the reason I pause here is because for most poorer countries, this is mostly what people are doing. And most humanitarian missions focus on the simpler defects, the, the um, shunt lesions, ASD, VSD. And I still hear these called one and done. Like basically we do this and the child will be cured. They will have no problems. This is a 2019 study that is quite alarming. Um, again, this is a complicated slide. I won't go over it all in depth, but essentially it compared a group of 2000 adults with simple congenital heart disease to controls, age match controls. And they found that their risks of, they looked at four things. Um, their risk of having a heart attack, acute coronary syndrome was twice as high as the match control their risk of stroke was six times as high and their risk of arrhythmias and a heart failure were 13 times as high as their age match peers. So we really need to deal with this. It is, there, it, nobody should be saying that anything is cured anymore. It's, it's just, um, we're going to um, replicate the problems we had in high income countries. And that's because we didn't know this. In high income countries, we have an excuse, a good excuse for what happened, which is we didn't know when this started that it was a lifelong issue. Most patients in our, my generation were told that they were fixed and there was no plan. There was no care system made or any provision like that. And even though we have known this since 1990, I started working in this area since 1990, working to both improve care access in terms of having trained providers available who can take care of adults and helping patients and families understand that they needed care. Still to this day, the majority of adult patients are not getting the care they need. So in Europe, where most care is free, 78% of adults with congenital heart disease are not in appropriate follow-up care. And it's also continues to be the case, there's a huge misperception that this is a teen problem, that basically the kids keep going to care and then they become teens and they wander off. That is not true. I could show you 10, 15 studies that shows that not true. In fact, that's always been not true. What is consistently true and is true still is that the large majority of children leave before age 12. Most recent study in the US said that almost half stopped going to care by age five. And this is because of the good news. This is if you're a mom or a dad with a kid and they had a big heart surgery and they're fine because these kids do look fine. They're healthy, they're going to school, they're not having problems. You go back, you go back. Every time you go back, the doctor says as my family was told over and over, she's fine, she's great, don't worry, she's going to be normal, just let her do her thing. You stop going back. You don't think you need to go back anymore. So I think there's a huge opportunity in countries developing their own systems to not do this. You don't have to make the mistakes we said. You can start planning for this in the beginning. So what do I mean by that? You can educate the patients and parents from the beginning. It's hard to do. You can say that kids will do well. You can say they'll have a really, you know, lots of normal parts of their life, but you need to be clear that 
this heart will never be a normal heart. They, it never will be, it will need lifelong care. And also as you're planning your CHD care, your pediatric care, start planning for that ACHD care now. I'm sure every, every country has patients who are adults with congenital heart disease, smaller or larger numbers. And if you're successful, that will grow. So as you're doing that developing of your planning for your system, you have to start thinking about how are we going to have care for that population. And make sure that in your messaging, in awareness, in medical education, program development and policy, you are clear that CHD is a chronic disease, that it is not a childhood health problem, and that this is a lifelong issue. So what other things are, am I hoping that you do based on this talk? Well, for those of you on the call who are parts of CHD organizations, whether they're professional, humanitarian, patient, family, I hope you will endorse our declaration and help us in our campaigns to raise awareness of congenital heart disease care as a human right. Um, Global Arch is developing regional networks um, in various areas around the globe and the PCHF is going to be taking the lead in their area, so I encourage you to get involved. There is a big role to, as we further develop our regional activities, um, recognizing that COVID has put some limitations in our in-person activities. Um, I really encourage all of you to get to know your patient family organizations in your area. And if there isn't a patient family organization in your area, to think about what role you might play in starting one. So. In my, my story is that I was a congenital heart patient who did very well, and then I suddenly did very poorly. And because I wasn't in the right kind of care, I was lost to care, I was almost killed. I almost was referred for a premature transplant. When I got to good care, I the reason I started doing what I did is my doctor said to me, Amy, you are very, very lucky. Most people like you would have died. You have an obligation to go and help in this area. And I never would have if my doctor hadn't said that. I was a busy person at that point. I was healthy, which was one of the reasons I was lucky. And so you, if you were a doctor or a healthcare provider, you can have a unique role in finding and identifying future leaders. So I really encourage you to do that because the people who will come to the groups naturally will be the people who need support. Those aren't necessarily the leaders. The leaders are the people you see as really being positioned to take a leadership role and speak out on this issue. Um, we encourage professional society support and engagement. And in a nutshell, I think the key to success in my experience in this landscape, this is always about a provider, a patient provider partnership, that the way we move forward is when the patients and families and doctors and healthcare providers and humanitarian organizations work together to get the word out and to make sure that every person born with congenital heart disease has a long and full life. Thank you. Thank you very much for such an informative uh, presentation. And uh, above all, more than that, uh, for being such an inspiration, Amy. Your journey is an inspiration for everyone. Uh, I'm uh, certain that uh, people uh, watching this webinar, uh, uh, reading your story, hearing about your story are inspired. I am inspired by your courage. And uh, uh, for you to uh, not give up, you know, because like you mentioned initially when you started off um, uh, awareness and advocacy, it was at its minimum. So uh, to reach this point, it's an inspiration in itself. And the work you're doing uh, uh, has inspired PCHF and all of us as well. And uh, it is definitely a step stone that um, it's a global effort. And coming together and learning from each other, I think that is one of the core um, advantages of uh, uh, advocacy and uh, the efforts that global art and organizations like PCHF are doing. So um, uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, wonderful. And uh, thank you uh, so much for that. Uh, actually, let's move on to some of the questions now.
there is a question for you, Amy. Uh, you have mentioned your journey and uh, how Global Arch came to be and uh, how it was uh, established and the processes that you went through. So um, what about the hurdles and the barriers that you faced? Uh, if you could just highlight a few of those and uh, how you overcame them. <laughs> Um, I, I have a question you might not know from the question. Is this personal hurdles in my personal journey or organizational hurdles or both? Uh, organizational and personal as well. Um, uh, just uh, the main uh, highlights that you think that could impact uh, people in LMICs, people who want to do something or are facing problems uh, uh, before they actually take the next step. Um, so the first hurdle I would say is the basic lack, lack of awareness. And this is one of the things that I think we all struggle with is that there just really is a huge um, lack of awareness of this issue globally still. Um, and I think that that's, you know, the, the trick to that is persistence. And I think that the congenital heart patient and family organizations can be very successful at this. In terms of the barriers, when we were starting Global Arch, interestingly, one of the first barriers we faced was when we were first developing our medical advisory board and working with professionals on this idea, one of the most common responses we got was people would say, oh, you don't understand. Um, patients and families in my country can't do that. They're not educated enough to do that. They're not, um, they culturally, we wouldn't do that. You know, this is a high income country thing, doing this kind of patient family group. And what I discovered was that couldn't have been more wrong. I have to say that once we started reaching out to the many patient family organizations that exist in low resource settings, I continue to be hugely impressed by how much more sophisticated and more educated, more effective these groups tend to be. And I think that's um, first of because in the richer countries, most of what the groups have been called on to do is things like peer support, which is great, but it's very not easy to do. It's very challenging, but it doesn't take sort of a high level of skill in terms of like government advocacy, where a lot of the groups in the low resource settings, what they're doing is raising money for surgeries. And what that means is they've learned how to work with governments and do all these very sophisticated things. Um, the other working volunteer led organizations um, at a startup stage if if people on the call are trying to get something started that's always the hardest thing because you need a small group of passionate people who can move it forward it's never just one person there has to be a critical mass and it's particularly challenging when it's a patient family led initiative because what that means is for example this fall the president, me, and the secretary of Global Arch were taking turns going in and out of the hospital. And you know, when you have patients and families that are managing chronic diseases, that can be very challenging. So I think that that's something when you look at what Global Arch is all your peer support and some of the very concrete things we talk about a lot are um, volunteer management, you know, how do you make sure that your organization is going to continue? How do you find the people you need? Um, fundraising, sharing successful ideas for that, um, as well as the higher level advocacy education things. Um, that's some organizational answers. I'm not sure if that's what we're looking for. Is there other aspects to that you want me to address? Uh, I think that uh, covers the gist of it. I think uh, just to get an overview of uh, some of the hurdles people should be able to expect uh, and not be intimidated by. I think uh, learning from your experience uh, uh, moving forward, uh, they should understand and relate that these are common problems. It's not just you. So I think I think that's uh, very well answered. Thank you for that, Amy. So I, I, with, I, let's I, move on. 
I'll go ahead. One more thing. I just would say things take enormous patience. Um, I, I was the first executive director and president of the Adult Congenital Heart Association in the US. I really thought that in two years we were going to change the universe. It took five years for our organization to even really um, get to a level where we were having major impact. So just be patient, which is hard. <laughs> At least yeah, for me. <laughs> Definitely. We are experiencing that firsthand, uh, but support from, like you mentioned, our organizations, uh, learning from them, it really helps you through the process. So uh, moving on to our next question, um, someone um, has asked, uh, how can someone in a low and middle income country become a global CHD advocate like you? <laughs> well, um we offer at if you go to the global arch website if you are joining there's two ways to join you can join as an alliance member which is an organization but there is also a role for what we would call emergent leaders so you can join as an individual and you can indicate that you want to be included in our leader development activities you will be invited to meet other leaders. As I said, we have, we're having one next Friday. There are wonderful sessions where we get on Zoom all together, talk, share challenges, talk about our organizations. You have access to all of the Global Arch webinars and resources. And that's one of the major reasons why Global Arch was developed. So if there are people on the call who want, the thing I would say is, join whatever you have in your area. A problem globally in all diseases, and I think it's part of human nature, is there is many, what we don't need is more diseases. Uh, I mean, more organizations rather. If there is a congenital heart organization in your area, which there may be, or people working in this area, try hard to find them and work with them because um, that is the best way to, to make to make, um, you know, to keep moving forward. And in fact, at Global Arch, we often find that, you know, we just got a board member who is a rheumatic heart disease advocate in Namibia. And there were actually two other groups in Namibia working in that area that we helped connect and get them working together. So that would be my other piece of advice is really make sure that you're looking for, including online, other people like you in your country, because that's, you know, that's who you need. You need a, a critical mass of people. Yeah, uh, thank you, definitely. And I think I would just like to add in there, I remember uh, Global Art uh, in their webinar series, they did uh, uh, um, address uh, uh, this issue of setting up a nonprofit organization in your community. So uh, uh, do log on to uh, www.globalart.com. Uh, is it .com or .org? Um, it's not Oregon. It's, it's got a dash in the middle, unfortunately, global dash arch global dash arch uh, you can access it through amy slides as well which we will make available to all the participants uh, and uh, you can uh, access those webinars and uh, learn a lot from those like uh, i did so uh the next question is uh, a lot of parents do not get time from their physicians and have a lot of questions but the, the doctors do not give them proper advice what would you recommend this is where I, as I said in my presentation, I think that the patient family organizations are incredibly effective. So if you have a group in your area, you can reach out to them. I would also say that if you are an English speaker, there's a huge amount of online information and resources here um, in this area. And if you go to the Global Arch website and if you click through to our member organizations, you can find lots of information. Um, however, I'm going to give one caveat, which is um, Global Arch recently did a survey of existing information available in print and online for patients and families. And virtually universally, the information that's available is written for people with high literacy. What I mean by that is um, there's ways you can sort of run things through a computer and, and, and analyze them, like what level of education you need to understand it. Most of them will come out at a college level, that you need a college degree to understand this. And so I do think there's a big gap right now in terms of concrete information that 
an actual patient or parent can understand. Again, I think that organizations are especially good at this, maybe not even in their written material, which may be more complicated, but when you talk to them to get it explained to you. I hope that answers uh, our uh, participants' question. Um, there is one question from me uh, to you, uh, for you, Amy. Uh, I was actually reading one of your papers. Uh, it was based on the transition uh, and transfer uh, from pediatric to adult care. So if you could uh, just um, highlight some of the key points, what are uh, the hurdles and how you overcame uh, and what uh, focus points should there be when you transfer um, the responsibilities or advocacy um, uh, focus areas uh, between a pediatric and uh, adult congenital heart uh, disease advocacy? Sure. Um, so first I will say, I, I actually hate the word transition and transfer okay. because I, again, want to highlight what we talk about, we talked about ACJ and we talk about at Global Arch is lifelong care. And the reason I say that is because when we talk about transition, we see this as a phase. We, and it's not a phase because not only do we know, as I said, that actually by the time people are 12, the large majority have already left. So if your goal, our goal here is not something to do with teens. Our goal is we have to make sure this person gets well-trained care their whole life, right? So it has to start from day one, way earlier than people think about educating that family to prevent loss to care. But then even after we become adults, so when we talk about transfer to care, the challenge there is that um, it's not like, at least in the US, that if that that I'm a package and they're gonna hand me to my next doctor because at least you know, in Europe and the US, people move, they may have different health insurance, they may, so people move around. So really I would encourage everybody to think about it as how can I empower this person so that they can go find the care they need their whole life. So they understand they need it, they understand what it needs to look like and they know how to find it um, because that is really what we're talking about. In terms of that specific process, what I do believe in, and the reason I still work on these things, even though the word makes me crazy, is you know, the process of taking control of one's health is an essential process for all of us. It's I have a child who's now 28. I watched her be a teen and take on responsibility. It's the same challenge, just specific to our disease. So I think that that. Um, first of all, I think it's in some ways culturally specific because we think of as being an adult. I, I did actually, I did, I, I recently got a master's in global health. I did my paper, my research on looking at the transition guidelines and giving them to um, care providers and patients and families in low resource settings and saying, do these work for your settings? One of the things the care, care guidelines say is they say that a person should make independent healthcare decisions apart from their family by between age 18 and 21. And one of my sources just left, she said, in India, you're not an adult until your parents die, just to be clear. <laughs> so I think every country is going to be different and we need to be really clear about that. Um, at the same time, the patients I talked to in those settings also said it's tricky because for the patient, what is underappreciated is often we want to take our care, but we don't want to hurt our family's feelings. That there's a huge piece of this of feeling like, um, you know, you, we need independence. Everybody needs independence to make their own decisions. Um, and so the one huge key factor that sounds so elemental, but I would put out there as something that every pediatric cardiologist could do. Right now, when she met alone with me, apart from my mother. And she would say to my mother, I just want to talk to her because she needs to practice talking about her heart defect without you here. Because that's really important. Because particularly since as people get older, there, there may be things they're not going to want to talk about in, in front of you. And that's related to my second hard and blunt thing to say, which is every woman with congenital heart disease 
what the basically what the guidelines say is they have to have a cardiac check before they become pregnant because probably they will be safe, but it is quite possible that something has changed inside of them that will make it extremely unsafe. What that means is pregnancy needs to be planned. There's no other way to put it. There cannot be unplanned pregnancy in congenital heart disease or we wish there wasn't. And that raises the need to really start talking to young people about um, family planning early, which again is a huge cultural barrier in many places, but this, you know, it has, it's an essential part of lifelong care. It, women with congenital heart disease have a hugely increased than men risk of death because of the risk of pregnancy. So um, thinking about how you're going to have that conversation and how you're going to promote independence and helping make sure that that person, um, I, I actually don't prioritize them completely understanding their disease. Years ago, a member at ACHA said to me, when my dishwasher breaks, I don't have to fix it. I just call the repair guy. So really they just need to know that when they have certain symptoms, they need to go to care and they need to know they keep, need to keep going. Thank you, Amy. I still have so many questions, but unfortunately we are running short on uh, time. But the, the good news is that we are getting some uh, signatures on the declaration at Global Arch. So that's a very big positive. And uh, before we end uh, today's webinar, uh, I would like uh, Mr. Farhan Ahmed to say a few words um, before uh, closing off. Uh, hi, Amy. Uh, hi, uh, Sama. Uh, I'm uh, greatly honored uh, that uh, today uh, one of my mentors, Amy, is here and you know, she's addressing people in Pakistan. Uh, the history goes back, uh, I think this was 2016, I believe, uh, you know, when we first time we introduced, uh, and I'm very thankful to Dr. Bavar. Uh, he introduced us to Amy Bistra, and then we were exposed to such a wonderful work that uh, Global Arc is doing. Uh, apart from, you know, Amy, one of being uh, a wonderful uh, a mentor, he's she's such a wonderful boss as well. So I, I can just tell Terrible. you, <laughs> Terrible. Uh, you know how difficult it is for us to manage time from our busy schedules, but she knows how to get the job done from the volunteers. So hats off to you, Amy. Uh, Amy, just one quick uh, question that uh, a lot of uh, uh, people here uh, keep on asking us. Uh, there is a huge disparity. You already spoke about, you know, low-income country and uh, uh, the way things are there in the developed countries. So, how do we deal with, uh, you know, this mindset? Uh, of course, we can't compare. But uh, since you have been dealing with other low-income countries like, uh, you know, Africa, other parts of the world, so how what, what do you suggest? That what what exactly should be? How do we uh, deal with the mindset that yes, this is how it is. But how do we do struggle? What should we be focusing on? So just to be clear, the mindset, you mean culturally of there, or do you mean like government or those kinds of things? Like uh, who, who, who's mindset changing? Everybody's? Yeah. I mean, I guess what I would say in terms of, I, I think, well, first of all, I want to say very clearly, I, I can't know what it's like to be a person in a low and middle income country. And a foundational piece of Global Arch is that it is so clear that only the people in that country know this, know what works in that country and that culture. Um, and so that's the first huge thing I will say because my, the more I talk to the patient and family advocates we have around the world, the more I am humbled and the more I understand what I don't understand. Um, I think that there's sort of two ends to the problem. One is the awareness issue of um, sort of the telling your story part about why people can care. And I think in low resource settings, 
the, I'm going to say something a little different than the it's a chronic disease because I think it's especially important to get the patient, the families to understand. And that we make the case for this child is worth saving. This person can be a very productive um, person, which we can. This woman will be able to get married and have children. And there's no better way to do that than have people there who are doing that. Um, and then at the same time, at the higher level, I would say that this, if you're talking about government, the answer to, well, why do we have to do something? It's always been like this is, well, if you actually want to meet the, you know, every country has a goal that they say to the World Health Organization, and we're going to keep lowering our infant mortality by X. You can't meet that if you don't start investing in it. And I know in India, they were very effective because they just got in front of the, the Pediatric Cardiac Society, got in front of government and gave them the information. They ran a study and they said, look, this is between the number two and the number four cause of infant mortality in India, in all these places, you have to work on it. So, you know, sometimes it's the stories, sometimes it's the numbers, sometimes it's the money saying, if you only need to invest this much money in doing this and you'll save that much money um, with care. So if you look at the data I showed on the rates of cardiac problems with people, You can see the way those early save a lot of harm because you're as good, at, you're better at this than I am. What am I leaving out? Oh, wonderful, thank you. I think that does address uh, uh, the community aspect of uh, um, addressing uh, uh, issues in LMICs when compared to uh, high income countries. You mentioned you do not like the word transition and transfer, but I think here uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a good connotation that uh, transferring and uh, transitioning uh, applied and tested uh, um, uh, interventions and uh, processes uh, from higher income countries to lower income countries. Uh, uh, surprisingly, the hurdles, like you mentioned, the mental health counseling, uh, we, there are some similar platforms. So uh, I think there is a high um, possibility for uh, 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 applicability uh, uh, from international, from higher income uh, countries to LMICs. So um, thank you so much once again, Amy, um, uh, for being a wonderful advocate for congenital heart disease, for uh, taking the time out uh, and uh, participating um, uh, in this webinar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Farhan and Ahmed, to our attendees, to our participants, to all the parents, and uh, looking forward to Global Arches next webinar and uh, to uh, seeing uh, all our PCHF uh, viewers again. Uh, for our next session. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Samara. Thank you, all the audience. Goodbye. <laughs>